Hello and welcome to eight years of config management. My name is Thorsten Rehn and I work for a company called Cybert Media where I first started in, back in 2008. Now, why should you care about our config management? Let me give you some numbers. We currently have 727 nodes under management. Our monitoring is checking uh, well over 10,000 services. Importantly, uh, at least in my opinion, last month we had 21 different people committing to our shared config management repository. And overall, they're averaging about 38 commits a day to the same repository. Getting to these numbers from zero was a very slow and steady uh, process that um, took around eight years. And many mistakes ma were made along the way. Some of them I want to share with you today. Our journey starts back in 2009. Now, what was the world like back then? Let me give you some context. In 2009, at the beginning, Michael Jackson was still alive. There was no iPad. There have been 15 different models of iPads ever since. Obama had just been freshly elected to the White House for the first time. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill was still a year away, and I'm sure you all remember that it took a while to clean up. Osama bin Laden was still hiding in Pakistan, and the world was kind of worried about swine flu. Personally, I had a lot more hair back then and just dropped out of university and started as a trainee in systems administration with Cyber Media. It was during that time that uh, I was given the task um, to build something that automates management of our web hosting customers. Simply enough, kept me from breaking anything else. And so I started figuring out, OK, we have these uh, web hosting customers. They were not making us a lot of money back then, but they had supported the company from the beginning in 1996. Um, so we kept them around and still tried to get, take good care of them because they were really loyal to the company. So in the beginning, of course, there was a shell script. Not try to get that started to you know, add a new customer, add a new website for an existing customer, uh, and stuff like that, add a new uh, database. But quite early on, I started running into the limitations of this. I wanted to improve on what we already had. I wanted to add uh, stuff like uh, statistics and, and more centralized management. So it just took me maybe two weeks before I started looking into config management. And the first thing that I looked at was Puppet, which at the time still used, used this cute little fella as a logo. I couldn't find this anywhere on the internet today, so um, that's just out of, an, out of an old presentation of mine. Kind of cute. But um, at the time, Puppet just kind of rubbed me wrong. I, I couldn't really get to grips with it in my old notes from the time. I said that the documentation was bad, and maybe it was just me being stupid, but I couldn't really make it work for me. Then I looked further, and I found bconfig. Yes, it's spelled BCFG2, but um, the developers all just call it bconfig for short. And that was a whole different story. The community was rather small, but in the best possible sense. They were really welcoming, and they helped me out a lot on IRC. And eventually, I even started contributing code back to the project, and even that logo you see up there. So that's kind of where I settled, where I could get started quickly and produce the results that I wanted. So I had my little um, web server set up here with two web servers and a database server. And I added uh, another virtual machine as a sort of controller that ran the config management on it. And then also had an LDAP server because I was curious to learn more about LDAP, and I figured it would be kind of nice for web hosting customers could use the same logins for their FTP data uploading and um, accessing their statistics on the web. So that kind of worked, out, worked very well for me, and that was sort of my little kingdom that I had, and around it was a vast sea of unmanaged systems that were really just administered in the traditional way, as in someone SSHs into a machine, does something, and it's done, and nobody ever knows what he did there. So that kind of worked that way for a while. Fast forward to 2011. And this part is a little emotionally challenging for me. Because I tried to expand my cool management setup to cover our entire infrastructure. 
And even back at, the, at that time, that meant different locations that were really um, strongly separated from each other and couldn't talk to each other. So what I eventually ended up with was this behemoth of a setup, where a developer would commit to a master server, you can see it uh, all the way at the top, that had uh, the bconfig uh, server on it, had still had a hugely expanded LDAP database that not only included user accounts, but now also the entire inventory of virtual machines and even websites, and you can, could configure website quotas in LDAP. It was all terribly over-engineered. But to add insult to injury, we had still had these separate locations um, that you see here, right below, and so I somehow needed to get the data out of the central repository to each location, but preferably only that data that the location needed for itself. So what I came up with was that um, with LDAP replication, you can restrict that replication through access control lists. And that was really um, probably the worst thing I ever did in my life. And now I had the data at the location, but I had already come up with a, a concept of uh, of a domain inside a location. You could call it an isolated cluster of, of systems. And they had still had these um, controller virtual machines that um, I had started with. So that was another step in the replication chain. And then we eventually were running LDAP on every production system, because why not? It just takes a couple of megabytes of RAM, right? And it was a great way to make changes to uh, a user in the master server and have it automatically replicated uh, down to each production system, in theory. In practice, this um, led to operational problems, but the code for it was also really messy. This is from the very first uh, commit that I found in this repository, and it's atrocious. You don't need to read it all. I just highlighted some parts. Um, if you look down in the lower third, you recognize this is actually um, some kind of XML file, and then uh, you have some Python code inlined at the top, which you can do with uh, bconfig. And, and of course, you have passwords in there committed in plain text, like, like you do. And then down below, um, you have this bound config file um, XML entity, which has a, a for loop embedded in it to create multiple config files. It's a huge mess, terrible. Um, eventually, we improved on this slightly by moving the LDAP code into a separate module. We got rid of the passwords, but it still retained that um, horrible stink and was uh, very unreadable. And while it uh, seemed powerful to me at the time, really what I was making was a huge mess. And eventually, we ended up with this kind of workflow. I couldn't even make a pretty slide for that, but um, let me just run through it real quick. First, obviously, would you get changes in Git, push that. That would trigger a post uh, update hook to rsync um, the contents of that repository to each bconfig server in, th in this um, whole tree that you saw earlier. But the LDAP replication wouldn't always work reliably. In fact, most of the time it wouldn't. So you had to SSH into e each node running slap D that was between the master server and the node you actually wanted to do something on, wipe the LDAP database and restart um, slap D to just um, re-trigger uh, the replication the hard way. Then you could finally SSH into the target node, run a local script there that would pull the configuration from the bconfig server and apply it to the machine. Now, at the worst of times, this could take up to 70 minutes for a complex system like our monitoring. Um, which is terrible on in itself, but we also had n no real confidence in the system, so we used um, the interactive mode that bconfig has, where it asks you for each and every change that it would make. And you could always tell that someone in the office was doing this, because you'd hear them push no, enter, no, enter, no, enter, very, very fast, very, very often, until they finally arrived at the change they actually wanted to make, and sometimes you had no accidentally then because you were kind of on a roll and then you had to start all over again. And then you could finally apply your change, notice that you made an error, typo or something, and then you would start all over again. Now, it wasn't always this bad. This is kind of a worst case scenario that I um, sketched here, but it could happen to you. And this was sort of the low point of conflict management 
that really made it clear that something had to change fundamentally. And that brings us to 2012. That was the time when I really started looking hard at what, how can we get out of the situation. And during that time, Chef was finally getting a lot of traction and um, had a lot of buzz around it. So I looked into that and I remember um, seeing a, uh, a statement on the Learn Chef website back then that said, instead of spending hours trying to get Chef installed, we recommend a free Chef uh, Enterprise Chef account and we'll take care of the Chef server for you. Now, I get it. You're trying to sell a product. But when you're already assuming that I have to spend hours just getting this to work, that didn't, just didn't sit right with me. Would I be spending more time managing the management? I really didn't want to deal with that. So uh, I looked into it a little further and still didn't like what I was seeing at the time. So ultimately, I wasn't really enthusiastic about um, go going the chef way. And Nowadays, that would have prob probably driven me right into the arms of Ansible. But if you look at the first commit in the Ansible repository, that uh, really just got started in early 2012 and wasn't really known to anybody yet. And this uh, disillusionment with um, server-based uh, config management systems kind of uh, sent me on this uh, path which many people frown upon but I was kind of interested in the challenge. How hard can it be? Can't I just uh, make this work? Why is this so difficult? So I tried uh, to do this myself. So in July 2012, I started um, my first uh, project trying to solve config management on my own, foolishly. And first it revolved around fixing, fixing bconfig because I liked a lot of the ideas in there. There was the idea that um, you had bundles, which most systems have some uh, kind of concept where you uh, take a collection of items like files and packages and whatnot, and you bundle them uh, together, and that's, that all evolves around a software package like, say, uh, the Apache web server, where you have an Apache bundle. And, but then I wanted to have a clear distinction of metadata that you would attach to each node that handles the specifics for this node. And combining bundles and metadata would yield the, um, the configuration for that particular node. I also liked and definitely had to keep an interactive mode because um, just culturally um, people expected this. They didn't trust config management and they were scared shitless about just, you know, running this machinery on a production server and hope, just hoping that it would do the right thing. So we had to have some kind of human in the loop mechanism so you could still say, oh no, I don't want this change. Don't do that. And I like the idea of having Python anywhere because I was uh, very familiar with Python already and um, I still wanted to retain that power now that I had learned where it can take you. There were also a couple of bad parts. I definitely wanted a better template engine. I didn't want to have to write um, any more XML just to describe um, my infrastructure. I wanted to speed things up by uh, applying multiple items in parallel and not just uh, uh, serially. And that, uh, of course, meant I had to deal with dependency management. Also, one of um, the weird uh, quirks of bconfig is it had, uh, for some reason, had very slow diffs. So after we generated a huge config file for our monitoring, it took a bizarre amount of time uh, for it to generate the diff. I still don't know why that is, but uh, it was definitely annoying. And I kind of worked on this um, for a couple of months, and then I realized I, w I wasn't doing enough good. I was just reinventing bconfig, uh, taking some parts out. I even reused some of their code, but it still didn't feel worth it. So I figured my approach to solve this had to be way more radical. I didn't want to deal with servers anymore. Do I really have to have that? Can I just take that out? I also didn't want to fiddle with agents running on each and every node and didn't want to sign certificates or, for them or anything. So there was this big disillusionment that um, I really wanted to take this thing apart and really put 
only put those parts back together that I really, really needed. And somewhere during that time while I was reading a man page, as one does, I realized that for decades we've been writing shell scripts that used system utilities and they were sort of an API for the whole system. And if you look at um, how stable these things have been for years, well, they're more stable than some proper APIs I've seen. So I was wondering, couldn't I use the existing authentication channel that we already had, namely SSH, everyone already had SSH access into our systems, and couldn't I use the existing utilities on the system to manage them? Would that be feasible? Would it, would it be really be as hackish as it sounds? I didn't think so, and that was kind of when all that vision for bundle wrap um, came together. And I, and I just tried it and wanted to see how that went. And by the time I got to this point, we were in 2013. And in June 2013, so that's a full year after I started um, tinkering um, with this uh, whole uh, I'm doing conflict management on my own idea, I, <clears throat> I started what uh, Bundle Wrap is today. Now, from the get-go, there, there were a lot of things that uh, were either impossible or hard to do with the existing solutions that I wanted to make possible. For example, BW test. You can type this simple command into any bundle wrap repository, and what it will do is go through each node you have configured and actually render all the config files in there. So at least you know you're not, you don't have any syntax errors in them. It also does some more internal consistency checks, and if you look at the last two lines here, you can also define hooks for that and do your own custom validation on top. Now, this is awesome because it requires no setup for you. You can just run it locally. It's terribly easy to just plug into a CI server. And now you can almost feel like a real developer, you know, because they have these tools. Why shouldn't ops people? Another thing that I always found odd is that many conflict management systems will just run whatever commands uh, they need to do and then just assume that they worked. Sure, they're item potent and all that, but I had really had the urge to make bundle wrap check everything that it did. And that's why the code is already set up in such a way that anything you can configure in bundle wrap can not only be set by bundle wrap, but it can also check that it actually worked and read that back. And that means that uh, bundle wrap has a verify command that can really go through each node and tell you the state of, of everything. And that always kind of seemed uh, more complete to me than uh, the dry run options you can find in other systems because it really just reads out what is there and it doesn't just assume that the command fails or makes uh, too many assumptions on that part. And af after you've run that, you get this nice uh, table rendered in your terminal, it looks really great, that tells you how many items there are on this node, how many of them are in a good state, and how many of them deviate from your config management. Something that was also very important to me was uh, being able to compose groups really the way I wanted to. Now, this is an example for how you can compose groups in bundle wrap, where you have this group um, that we call important stuff. It has a couple of members in it. Uh, here we have just uh, that old DB host that we set statically, that's possible of course, but you can also use regex to include um, all nodes that start with cluster one. And you can even go further by defining functions if you really need that power to decide whether uh, no, a given node should be in that group or not. Here we just look in that node's metadata, have we marked this node as being a production system, and then we would add it into the group. And after you've done that, you can even remove nodes again when you have these little exceptions that you need to make, and just because we could, we're removing Debian nodes here. We still like Debian, of course. So. That's uh, an example of um, how flexible you are when composing uh, groups in your infrastructure, which is obviously very important when you have a lot of systems and a lot of diverse groups of nodes that you're dealing with. Another important concept is metadata and how it relates to groups. 
Consider this example. You have a group that's called Germany, and in its metadata it says um, all nodes in Germany should use this particular name server. Then it also says that the Frankfurt group is a subgroup of Germany. In the Frankfurt group, you set a different name server in metadata, and by default, they will be merged. So node one, which is a member of the Frankfurt subgroup, will have both name servers, except we can also override this um, name server again, and if you wrap it in Atomic, you can make sure that um, the third name server doesn't get added to the list, but it rather overrides these name servers. So that's an example of how you can use groups to assemble metadata for a node and really override defaults when you need them. You can take metadata even further. Um, I don't want to get uh, into this too deep, but every bundle can also define metadata processes, which are really just Python functions where you can mess around with that metadata and put stuff in, uh, in a very dynamic fashion. And so I was working on this for a time, and I really liked the concepts and the sort of structure that um, came along with it. And that brings us to 2014, when, when we were starting to use bundle wrap in production for Ernest. Um, not that much yet, but, it, but it, we um, really tried to use it for real. Now, Let's talk a bit about what our infrastructure looks like. I've prepared um, this chart here. And what you see on the x-axis is each and every bundle that we have, they stretch all the way to the right. Um, so it's uh, just shy of 200 of them. And on the y-axis, you have how many nodes these bundles are assigned to. So um, you have the bundle for the Apache web server. And um, you can, that's probably just around here somewhere. And you can see, okay, it's assigned to 500 nodes. That's just what this chart says. But from the average and the median um, that's uh, noted here, you can see, yes, we have a few bundles that are assigned to a lot of nodes, but the majority of bundles is assigned to just uh, three nodes or less. Here I've put it on a logarithmic scale. It's the same chart, just on a different scale, where I can really see that uh, around one third of our bundles just apply to a single node. So the infrastructure is very diverse. We don't have a lot of clusters with 40 nodes that all look the same. We have to care deeply about each and every individual system and often have to come up with special cases. And BundleRap, uh, I think, does that very well. One way to inspect a node and how, with complex configuration is using BWplot which um, generates dot output um, that you can pipe into GraphVis, and then it will render an image for you. Now, I've done this for a real node in our configuration as it is today, and this is the result. Now, you can't, probably can't see anything here. Um, what you're looking at is a 52 megabyte PNG file. Um, let me zoom in a little closer. Okay, now you maybe can make out some things. Um, maybe you can even see some of the lines. Um, can zoom even closer, and finally we get to see at least a bit of what's going on here. What we're looking at is the apt bundle for package management on Debian and Ubuntu, and it has different items in them like files and actions and apt packages itself, and they're all connected through dependencies. The arrows that you see going on there are all different kinds of dependencies. Now, um, for example, when you're installing apt packages and BunWrap is inherently con um, parallel, so we need to take care of package management managers because they use log files. You can't install two apt packages at the same time on a system, so you need to make sure that we install them one by one. And the way BunWrap does this is by um, daisy chaining all the package items in a, depend in a sort of dependency chain and make sure every package depends on another package and so forth so you can only apply them one after another and the, all the other stuff can um, still run in parallel like files because um, you can obviously upload two files at the same time for example. 
Now, this whole output for a whole node isn't terribly useful, but um, what bundle wrap can do, um, if you end up with a dependency loop, it will also give you a trimmed down version of this um, view where you can really see what's, what's going on and where, you're, where you might have introduced a redundant dependency or something. So, and it makes nice office art if you're that kind of type. Another thing that had been really important to me is um, understanding configuration as a Merkle tree. Now, um, if you've never heard of the term Merkle tree, it's pretty easy to explain, actually. I have a couple of items spread across two different nodes in this example. So I have a file, a directory, a service, and then on another node, I have another package and a file. Now, what I can do is look at how are these things configured in bundle wrap, create a representation of that, and run a hash function over it. So now I have, for each item, I have one hash that will tell me exactly how is this item configured. We'll see how that looks in a minute. I can then take all of these hashes and aggregate them into hashes for each and every node. By hashing all the item hashes for one node, I get just one hash that represents the configuration of an entire node. And then, of course, I can take all my node hashes and hash them together, and now I have one hash value that represents the state of my entire repository. Let's see how that looks in practice. What we're doing here is we have a node, which is uh, GCE as Media One Netbox, and we're going to show um, what does that item uh, look like that uh, controls the file at C hosts. You see there's a content hash, and then you have um, other ownership and permission attributes, and that really is the uh, entire configuration that BundleWrap has for this particular file. And then we just aggregate that into a hash. The hash you see at the bottom now is just the uh, output of the previous command run through um, SHA-1. And then you can go one step up. OK, now show me the hashes for all files or for all items on this node. I've just uh, included three here. You see there's for each item, for each file, and there's a package in there too they end up with one hash each. We go up another level. OK, show me now you can show me um, the aggregate hash for this particular node. And again, that's just the output of the previous command run through a hash function. From there, we go up even further. OK, now show me the hashes for all nodes. And finally, we end up with just BW hash. And what that will do is generate your entire configuration generate a hash value from it and display it to you. Now, why is this important? And I'm not aware that any other config management system does this. Suppose you're doing some refactoring in your config management code. You're just um, trying to clean up some stuff, and it's all very complicated, but you don't want to make any actual changes to your nodes. You're just trying to produce the same result, but in a different way. What you can do is generate this hash beforehand and after, and if they match, you can be confident you didn't cause any unintended changes on your node. And that's a really powerful assurance to have. It can also be used for other things, like say, you made some changes, but you're not really sure how many nodes are affected. By comparing the node hashes before and after, you can really tell if a node has changed through um, different points in your Git history. I love this feature, and I think it's really powerful, and and it, um, I think one or two times it really saved my bacon when I made a huge change that impacted a lot of things and, I, and um, there was some small detail that I missed. So these are some of the more advanced features um, that BindWrap has. You, you won't use them every day, but that's just the possibilities that uh, arrive from the um, internal structure that we came up with. And with that, we can make another jump into 2016. Now, that was a huge year for our config management. And you can just see that um, by the number of commits to the repository. What you see here uh, in the graph is not the total number of commits, but just how many commits were added each year. 
And it's pretty easy to see that things started uh, relatively slow in 2009 and slowly worked their way up to 2015, even though we had this horrible infrastructure behind it. But then in 2016, activity almost tripled. And that was a huge deal for us. Now, why was that? I've prepared here a chart of the number of bundles that we managed. And you can again see that bconfig had a slow start in 2009 when I was tinkering with it. Uh, adoption increased uh, between 2012 and 2013 when we kind of made it mandatory to um, put all changes that are done to our infrastructure in under config management. And then in 2014, we started um, finally using bundle wrap and it took us almost two years to migrate from bconfig to bundle wrap. See, it's a huge, very long time. Config management systems always carry this huge moment of inertia where you don't really want to rewrite your entire configuration, but uh, to some extent you have to when you're switching. And that's really painful to do, but once you get through that phase, um, as you can see, the rewards were quite visible because as soon as we switched off bconfig, activity increased dramatically. And that really felt liberating because we had collected a lot of experience as part of these um, past few years. And now it really felt like we arrived where we wanted to be. Another important change that we uh, made during 2016 was mandatory pull requests. I, and that's one of these changes where I have absolutely no idea how we ever lived without it, where everyone would just push into master and think it's probably OK. And when you introduce a change like that, um, there's, there's obviously a lot of hesitation. How, many how much time will we um, really spend doing reviews? I can't make any changes immediately. Do I have to wait for this uh, stupid review? What if nobody has time and can only review my changes tomorrow? I need to do it now. And that was a problem which we addressed uh, with node locking. With bundle wrap, you can say, OK, I want to lock this particular item on this particular node for the next three days. You can um, also lock entire bundles on a particular node, or you can lock the entire node. It's really quite flexible. You can, again, show what, what uh, locks are present on each node. And as you can see here, they're, um, they're identified by these uh, simple IDs. Um, they have an they always have an expiry date. Um, they affect certain items. And what you uh, can't see on the slide here, there's uh, another column at the end for a comment that you can leave so people know, will know why you locked this particular node and what you're doing there. And now when someone else tries to apply configuration to this node, they will just skip that particular file, and they can still do the other work they're doing on this node. And that gives you time. Um, in the example here, I've uh, locked it for three days to get that pull request review in. And after that has happened and um, your change has been merged into master, you can um, remove that lock and everyone um, will uh, be in the same state again. Now, this process, of course, isn't perfect. People still forget to lock nodes and then override their changes. Um, we're still working to figure out um, how we can prevent that and make uh, locking more intuitive and easy. So you will do it automatically. But um, for me, this is one of the strong points of being able to apply configuration directly from your machine, where you control the state, where you can work on your own branch in Git, and just apply changes directly to a node. Because sometimes you need to make changes now, because you're setting up a DNS change for a customer, or you need to react to some situation, or you just need to keep a deadline, whatever. You can absolutely do that and still get the benefit of a code review later. Another important um, feature um, that we uh, came up with is secrets. When you create a new bundle wrap repository, it will automatically generate these two keys for you. And um, one neat way you can use this is um, for passwords you don't really care about. 
let's look at what we're doing here. We have this file called Etsy secret and we just want to write a, a password in there. We do that by just passing any string that somehow describes that password to this password for function. And what it will do is take your string that you can really make up anything you want and derive a password from the key in that uh, secrets file and your string. Now, this is very useful for um, situations where you can control both sides of how a password is used. Think of a web application that needs to access its database. You don't really care what the password looks like and what, it was, what is in there. You just want a secure password that's configured the same way on both sides in the database and in your web application. And the cool thing is, when, you, when someone leaves and you switch out the secret and apply your configuration to all nodes, you'll automatically rotate, rotate all these passwords, but, uh, but they will still match on both sides, even though they've actually been changed. So that's a nice little side effect that we have. And that brings us to 2017. So we're almost there. And this chart that I have here is probably the one I'm most proud of. Um, it shows how many contributors each month different people committed into our config management repository. You can see in the early years it was just me working off and on on this. And then over time you had more people come on board. But things really exploded at the, at the beginning of 2017. And we peaked last month at 21 different humans committing into that repository and they come from seven different teams in our company, which is really a great kind of uh, adoption to have. And the best way, I think, to pull this off is by just getting one team really trained in it and then send out ambassadors in those other teams and embed them there for a while. You can call it DevOps if you want. And really enable these other teams to make these kinds of infrastructure changes in a way that's still reviewed. That's why we have pull requests. And through pull requests and the conversations that go on in there, you can really um, make those other teams aware of the challenges that um, the operations department has when it comes to maintaining all of this configuration. And of course, the other teams already also see everything else that's going on in the infrastructure and um, get a better sense of where their application fits in. Now, these charts wouldn't be complete if I can show um, the progress of the number of nodes. But um, as you can see, the data for bconfig2 is rather spotty because, remember, we kept all this information in LDAP. And databases are not always great at um, telling you how their state was two years ago. So um, just the ballpark numbers I have there are taken from old LDAP backups that I found lying around. With bundle wrap, uh, you can see the data is much more accurate because finally we had each node committed to the repository as text because we finally realized that we don't need to have those in the database. Now, as we went past 700 nodes, um, that also brought, brought with it some more challenges to how to do inventory for these and how to keep an overview of what's going on. And a pretty cool feature that's relatively new is metadata tables, where you can just look at a certain metadata key for a certain group. And it will give you a nice table. Here I can, here I can see of all our systems running on Google Compute Engine, which one of these are in production and which ones aren't. Now, these tables can also be restyled quite easily to be more grep friendly. And that lets you form some really powerful queries in your command line, so suddenly bundle wrap itself feels like a database again, and if you need to come up with any sort of list for any sort of purpose, you can very easily do that in your shell using just grab and cut and sort and all those other good things. Now, scale is uh, um, an important issue, mostly for us, not in sheer numbers, but in complexity and diversity. Take a look at this picture. This is gen automatically generated from data in our bundle wrap repository, and it shows what we call our site-to-site -site network. 
So all these um, nodes that you see here um, represent different locations that we have in some um, way, shape, or form. You can see we um, have our own uh, data center in Frankfurt. Um, we have uh, several with ProfitBricks. We have some with Google Compute Engine, a little something at AWS. It's really spread out all over the place. And of course, also includes our office locations. Now, all of these locations are connected through IPsec VPNs with um, BGP doing dynamic routing between them. And it's re really all very complex and would take days and days to set this up manually. But with config management, once we had that all figured out, we can describe it at a very high level. This is right taken from our metadata, where you just, okay, you have some notion of what that location is, and then you just define which location you want to um, create a connection to, and just write that as a pair in this particular piece of metadata. And then you describe each location in more detail. So you can um, tell it uh, which, uh, loca which networks it should announce over BGP, which a AS number it has. And just from that, we get all these IPsec connections. We get all the dynamic routing. So if one location goes down for some reason, we can route around it. it. It has worked really well. And this kind of thing um, just isn't possible without config management, in my opinion, because you'd be running in circles all day and never know um, where you need to make a change to uh, fix your connection. Config management here really shines because you can make sure that every one of these locations is configured the same and is talking to each other the same way, which is, of course, uh, especially important with IPsec. Now, let's take a minute to talk about integrations. I um, previously said that um, talking to LDAP was one of the huge mistakes we made with uh, back in the bconfig era um, because it uh, created this dependency and at some point, the thing was very inefficient. It ran ten tens of thousands of um, LDAP queries just uh, during one single apply operation. And that, of course, took a lot of time. Now, what you can do with the information that's contained in the repository, well, you can obviously create um, images for documentation, like the one I showed you earlier with the site-to-site -site network. You can also talk to your domain registrar or the DNS subsystem to see um, if you have configured any um, unused domains and um, help with cleanup there. And since you're also configuring IP addresses for virtual machines, you can also push into your IP management system. That's all easy because um, it's just a script that's in, in that repository and you can use it every now and then to update information in other systems. You don't need that to be live at all. But that's taking data out. Taking data in from another source is a little more tricky. And the classic use case is LDAP. We still want to put all users in LDAP in some kind of way because LDAP is still a great database for storing user accounts. And the way we solve this is using um, a simple JSON dump. Now, that's one of these ideas where you think, huh? is that really sensible? But it, it really works quite well in practice because you don't add users every day. At least we don't. We, we still hired a lot of people last year. But even then, um, it's OK to just run this import script again every now and then and pick up the new users. So we take all the information we need out of LDAP just dump it into a JSON file and commit that to the repository. And now BundleWrap can just read from the JSON file in the repository and always has that information available. And that is a huge deal because now we can work offline on a train where we have no internet and you can't, can't talk to this LDAP server. Another problem that can happen is what if your LDAP server goes kaput and you need to set it up uh, again in a different virtual machine? If your config management depends too heavily on LDAP, then you, you end up with the chicken and the egg problem where you can't provision the LDAP server because the LDAP server is down. If you cache the information locally, you can always use it. There's another case that we need to handle is um, secrets. We keep all our uh, different kind of passwords that need to be read by humans um, and uh, stuff like SSL, private keys, in a software called TeamVault. 
And that is a live connection where bundle wrap will really, during um, the, apl the uh, apply process of uh, the configuration, talk to that system over an API and pull the data out. But I still don't want this connection to be mandatory. So the way we solve this is you can switch it into a dummy mode with an, an, with an NVAR. And that will make this backend always return just dummy values for passwords and private keys and stuff like that. Because when you're developing um, stuff for this on a train, you don't really need the actual certificate. You don't really need the actual password. You just need something to arrive in there that kind of looks like a password. And, and then you can still go about your day and do most of your developing. And doing things this way has the very nice property of tying one git hash in your repository directly to one of the BW hashes that you can generate. If I switch off the um, Team Vault uh, connection and replace it all with dummy values, I always end up with the same BW hash for the same git hash. So even 10 years from now, I can go back and be confident that I don't depend on any external uh, database to reconstruct um, what I was doing 10 years ago. And that's something that became very apparent to me when I uh, was doing the research for this talk, that so much data from the past was just gone because we were pulling it live out, another, out of another system that doesn't have the kind of history um, that, like it has. And I still um, find this very important to, to this day to have that kind of um, parity between how does my configuration look and what's in the Git repository. And I try to keep it, always keep it as complete and tied to each other as possible. And this will, of course, also let you do a more interesting history spelunking, where you can uh, use Git bisect more effectively by going back, because now you can also roll back changes um, in Git you can't roll back changes in an external database when you're doing bisect and try to, try to find uh, a problem that was introduced when you added that uh, new node or something, if you pull your nodes out of LDAP. Now, having this kind of repository where everybody works on one giant repository with a huge history has the benefit of um, it being also a poor man's Dropbox. Because if everybody works every day using that repository, it also means they're pulling that repository almost every day. So you can assume that every one of your ops people and even the developers that are using the system will have a reasonably recent checkout of that repository. And we abuse that by putting more stuff in there that isn't directly used um, by bundle wrap, but that we call the emergency kit. And that's... Uh, it's just a really primitive list of phone numbers, for example. Because um, if you have a large outage and you need to call all your colleagues to help you, chances are you just got a new phone and haven't synced your contacts yet. We actually had that problem at, at a time. And so this way, at least you can be confident that everyone can reach everyone at any time. We also put in a a complete grab-friendly dump of our IP address management system there, so even if DNS completely goes down, we can still find stuff and figure out which IP it has. It's, it's often overlooked how much we rely on DNS and how we can't figure out IP, uh, what IP addresses we connect to if it goes down. So we kind of ensure against that uh, failure mode as well. Critical secrets are also in there, and of they are encrypted, of course, with the secret keys you saw earlier. And that is just to prevent you know, uh, other chicken and the egg problems, uh, like, okay, so the NetApp filer that hosts the password management system just went down. Um, what's the admin password for the NetApp filer? Okay, I'll just check the password management system that I can't reach anymore. And that's a nice place to just put those very low-level credentials that you need when everything goes dark. And just mundane data center contact info. Who do you call to get access? This uh, has also stuff like building security, facility management, just what you could need if everything goes dark, where do you start? That's a, always a good question to ask yourself. If 
the power goes out in the entire world, where do you start to turn things back on? Where do you need access? How can you bootstrap your entire infrastructure again? So let's summarize um, sort of what our experience have been. Having the right tools is important, obviously. Um, but I think if you can't find them, don't be too hesitant to build them. Not everyone should build their own config management system, and as you can see, it can very uh, easily turn out pretty badly if you do. But um, if you find it interesting, and, and like me, I, I've, been, I've been doing this for more than four years now, and I still tr very much care about the subject, and uh, there's still releases every, uh, about every other month. And also, definitely open source it. Why not? Just not everybody has to use it. Nobody knows about bundle wrap, really. Uh, it has just like a, over 100 stars on GitHub. It's nothing compared to Ansible or anything. Maybe this talk will change some of that. But I'm okay with it. Open sourcing, um, what you're doing there, not only invites other people to um, collaborate on that and maybe contribute back and uh, stabilize your project, but it also forces your own mindset to be more um, open to other uses and avoids kind of building these special bells and whistles that really only you need. So that creates sort of a firewall against that where, you, where you'll be naturally hesitant to put these little things in there that will only trip other people up and that nobody else will need. So I kind of use that as an assurance that what I do there will be generally useful for other people as well. And that usually creates better software, of course. Now, I've touched on this a few times already, um, but treasure your Git history. When I was doing the research for this talk, every now and then there were, was a small crowd that gathered behind my screen and was uh, looking at how we did things three years ago and how horrible it all was. It was really such a great experience for the team, just being reminded of the way that we came together and how we survived all this uh, crappy infrastructure that we had built around it. And how fast we were now processing changes and how many pull requests we were doing each month. And that really put things in perspective for the team and was, an, was a nice experience. Also, being, go, being able to go, go back and visualize that um, sometimes creates new ideas. While I was preparing this talk, I, found, I thought of some ways to clean up metadata processors for bundle wrap, some really advanced stuff that you, you don't really need to know about, but it, it created this uh, new sense of, okay, when I look at my history, what can I learn from that? And you can only do that if you have your history available and if it's com as complete as possible. So I'm really glad that we kept this um, same repository since 2009 and not moved to a new one when we introduced bundle wrap but we kept them all in the same Git repository because that makes it a lot easier to inspect your history and see how much activity there was, what um, events and changes increased or decreased activity because people were more hesitant to use the system. I find that really important. Another point is um, allow a culture to evolve and evolve is really the key part here. Um, I can't really say for sure how much this uh, applies to other people, but coming uh, through this ch painful journey that we had um, was really important to deeply root config management in our operations culture. And going from scratch from really what features do we really need and having to build them for us was a huge plus. If we had been starting out with a super powerful config management system, chances are that there are some features that we would use just because we can. And that's dangerous. Like you um, saw um, the, in the terrible way how I um, abused uh, bconfig2. So acknowledge that config management carries with it a huge moment of inertia. And that if you go too quickly, you will accumulate way too much technical depth. I know everyone is sick of hearing about this, but really try to go things slow, accept that it will take years 
to really establish this, that you can't go f from one day to the other to managing your entire infrastructure, and that's okay. Acknowledge that it's a pro process, that it needs to evolve on a tactical side, um, that your processes need to evolve, and also the mindset and the heads of your people need to change. And they can only change slowly by learning each step and realizing why did we make that step. And that just takes time for humans, in my opinion. So, where do we go next? One thing that I will need to address very soon is speed once again. Right now, um, generating the entire configuration for our entire infrastructure on my uh, machine right here with the default concurrency settings takes 4 minutes and 11 seconds. Now, that's 700 nodes, and there are very few situations where I would really need the entire infrastructure. But when you do a BW hash, that's exactly what you need to do. So faster software is always better software. So I'll try and see if we can squeeze a few minutes out of that. The other interesting topic um, that we'll uh, probably address in the next couple months is orchestration. Um, one of my colleagues uh, ex uh, expressed it quite, quite nicely just earlier. Um, what we're doing right now is mostly configuration as code. Infrastructure as code, that we don't really do. We are only manage what's inside our virtual machines, but the setup of the virtual machine itself, that we still do um, using old-fashioned scripts and um, using uh, some uh, graphical tools even. There, we can expand more and um, also create that in a way that is tracked in Git. So we know when was this virtual machine really added, who did it, why did they do it, and how did it all end up here. I'm also, I've also started work on a server component for bundle wrap, but that's very different from the other configuration management servers that um, you may know. Some things that I want this um, tool to answer is who applied where, when? What was the state of the node before the apply um, happened? What's, what Git revision was applied and who did it? Maybe even allow them to leave a comment on why they did that particular change. Then I want to automate looking into BW hash and just very easily show for each commit, okay, how many nodes are affected? Which ones, which files on these nodes were affected? And as we add more and more data to our metadata, like information about, is this a production system? What kind of uh, service level agreement does it have? We already want to expose that data that we already put in there to other systems to consume. So that's another really interesting thing that you can do once you have a certain amount of data committed in your repository. And then we can really take things further and maybe start uh, tinkering with automatic BW applies. So just run, what we, do, what we do right now is some guys will, every Monday, they'll do a B, BW apply all just to make sure um, there's no configura not too much configuration drift um, across our infrastructure. And automating that um, will be tricky. The, I think there are a lot of fine details that we'll need to get right. Um, but um, it will be interesting to see where that goes. And then there will also be um, automated uh, commits for trivial things like changing the on-call rotation, um, which is another thing that just happens every week. And maybe we can automate that as well. And that con concludes my talk. Thank you very much. If you would like to learn more about BundleWrap, you can do that on bundlewrap.org. If you'd like to learn more about our company, um, there's the website. Um, we also have a booth. It's the one with the obnoxious LED wall. You really can't miss it if you, you come here. Um, I put the slides up on speaker deck. Um, and you can f always find me on Twitter, of course, if you have any questions. Now, we're already, we've already hit the time limit here. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be hanging out at a booth for the rest of the day. And I'll be happy to chat about any kind of config management issues you want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you.